Yeah, so now we have uh, Dr. Cerniero from uh, Portugal giving us her talk on gastric uh, tumors. Uh, like she has been like, a, like a, if you go online and try to find more about her, like she's been described as an excellent and dedicated scientist and uh, uh, she's the professor and the head of the department of the hospital at uh, in Portugal. Her main work like has been focused on uh, a lot of gastric cancers and uh, she's been a spectacular teacher to a lot of people around the world. She's been a president of the European Society of Pathology and I had the pleasure of being a co-editor with her on the WHO Blue Books and uh, when you meet her in person like her smile is very infectious actually. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time and uh, in, so I know you are, you are, there, there's a lot of issues uh, that you are like right now going through because of the COVID thing in your family and in your country but in spite of that you have found time to like uh, learn from your expertise so thank you very much. So you can go ahead and share your screen and then we can start your talk actually. Yep, we can see a screen now. Yes, here we are. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, take my video off so now the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Actually, I want to, to thank very much the organizers for the invitation to participate in this amazing masterclass, bringing together, well, authorities all over the world in the different topics in pathology. So as uh, it was explained, I come from Port Portugal. It's a fantastic country, despite the pandemic all over. We will be most welcome to visit the country. We will enjoy a lot. So this is a brief outline of what I'm going to address. And uh, I divided my presentation in several sections. The first will address inflammatory infectious disorders in the stomach. We'll discuss a uh, rare entity We'll afterwards move to gastric tumors and compassing gastric adenomas and special types of gastric carcinoma. The first case concerns a 10 year old boy with a history of iron deficiency anemia and responsive to iron therapy. There was no weight loss, no digestive symptoms, or systemic complaints. Fecal occult blood testing, the celiac disease screening, both were negative. Here you have the scan slide that I think that uh, several of you at least had the opportunity to study, to analyze before. And this is a biopsy from the corpus. And as you can see, you can identify the fovular area, but the gland zone is substituted by a dense inflammatory infiltrate. Thus, uh, uh, inflammatory cells are mainly lymphocytes, as you can see. You can see one, two, three eosinophils. You can find them also in the stomach. And uh, some of the glands were permeated by inflammatory cells. So this lesion uh, being observed in the corpus of the stomach uh, will lead to the diagnosis of chronic gastritis first, second, atrophic chronic gastritis. And in this specific case, intestinal metaplasia was not a feature. So you were in face of one child with chronic atrophic gastritis, which is not a common situation. So we asked for clinical information and we got this from the peripheral hospital from where the patient had been referred to our hospital. And there was very relevant information there describing antiparietal cell antibodies. So chronic atrophic gastritis in the body in the presence of antiparietal antibodies that gives you the diagnosis of autoimmune gastritis. The, the patient had, as I mentioned, microcyte hypochromic anemia, but there was no response to tablets of iron. In the family history, there is something that is relevant because the mother of the patient, 41 years old, uh, there was also history of iron deficient C anemia that was proved later to be also autoimmune gastritis. There were no special features in the physical examination except for mucosal paler. So the diagnosis in this case, as uh, I said, is a 10 year old boy was autoimmune gastritis. 
Is it common in the stomach of children? No, it is not at all. And so we went to literature to see what is written there. And we found a couple of uh, reports of cases of autoimmune gastritis in pediatric age. And uh, the highlight of the circumstance that this is an underestimated condition. So clinical information, lab data should always be put together in the setting of chronic atrophic gastritis involving the corpus and fundus of the stomach. There is another paper describing a review of three cases. And there is in the literature the discussion about the pathogenesis because it has been suggested that the, these lesions in the stomach can be due to a cross-reaction of antibodies direct to H. pylori that will also be um, aggressive for the gastric glands and specifically for the parietal cells. And I want to recommend you very much to have a look at this paper that was recently paid, uh, published 2020 on autoimmune gastritis. It's a primary paper from very important pathologists in the stomach and where you can find the structure of the corpus and fundus where this type of lesion develops. Just to remember you that you have mucous neck cells, you have parietal cells, you have sheath cells, you have some of the statin secreting cells besides ghrelin and endochromaffin like cells. And here in autoimmune gastritis, the cells of interest are the parietal cells and very specifically the protein pump system. Here you have a busy slide that I don't want to waste much time describing it but just to highlight the role of the parietal cells, the putative role of H. pylori and the uh, initiation of the process, the involvement of uh, lymphoid cells, mainly T cells, not only uh, for the connection with the parietal cells, but also for the secretion of cytokines, namely interferon gamma and TNF. And both are responsible for the changes that will lead in the parietal cells to their apoptosis and so to their destruction. Because of this, there is increased the production of gastrin in the antrum, and this gastrin will lead to hyperplasia of the endochromaffin like cells that secrete histamine and can end up in, with a situation of neuroendocrine neoplasia in the stomach associated with the autoimmune gastritis. In parallel, there is stimulation also of B cells, and these will secrete antibodies for against the intrinsic factor and against the, the parietal cells, as I mentioned, and these antibodies were present in this patient. So that was a, a peculiar case of autoimmune gastritis in a child. The second case concerns a seven-year-old black boy was brought to the emergency department because of nausea, vomiting, epigastric pain, subscribed body temperature and malaise two weeks before, after an acute tonsillitis. I want to highlight that it was this infection before the development of this clinical situation. The physical examination revealed poor general aspect and generalized abdominal pain with no tenderness. The patient was submitted to endoscopy, to upper GI endoscopy and gastric biopsies were collected. I wonder if you had the opportunity to have a look at those. They are very, very impressive in my, in my opinion. And what you can see is that there is dense inflammatory infiltrate in the lamina propria. But contrary to the previous case in which you had lymphocytes, here you have polymorphs mainly neutrophils, and this destroy the glands, just giving you this appearance of crypt abscesses that are dispersed in the mucosa. And this inflammatory infiltrate is very dense. You can see the old thickness of the mucosa involved by this inflammatory process. Here, other case of the destruction of glands. And in this specific case, there was this giant cell in deeper sections that cannot be confused with the granulomatose reaction because this is a foreign body giant cell and there's nothing to do with the granulomatose process. Here you can see the other glands 
also destroyed by this inflammatory infiltration that, as I mentioned, was diffusely involving the gastric mucosa. So we asked for additional clinical information and from CT scan, we obtained the information that the gastric wall was thickened. The, old, uh, the thickness of the gastric wall was much increased. And the endoscopy features were those I'm showing to you with the hyperemia generalized and with erosions. So we came up with these findings and the histology is really relevant for this diagnosis. We came up to the diagnosis of phlegmous gastritis this paper is now published as a case report, and you should be aware of this. First, because it's very rare, <coughs> it's a cause of acute rapidly progressive gastritis. It's due to bacterial infection of the gastric wall, and the prognosis can be very poor and can be fatal. So the diagnosis is a kind of an emergency. I remember to have seen this case it was Friday afternoon and I immediately called the pediatrician telling about the result and the patient was put under antibiotics. So in this specific case, the outcome was okay and uh, the, the patient is well and um, there are no major concerns about it. But as I said, what I want from here is to, that you consider in your diagnosis of acute gastritis this entity and I want to highlight the impor importance of a prompt diagnosis for successful treatment is an odd diagnosis that should be reported immediately. So as I mentioned, the final diagnosis was phlegmonous gastritis in this child. Case three is a very easy case. I think that those of you who had uh, the opportunity to look at the scan slides came to the diagnosis easily. It concerns a 49-year-old female. She was HIV positive with a medical history of gastric ulcer and she was referred to the hospital for endoscopy because of uh, epigastrology. Here you have the samples of the gastric biopsy. This is the best. And as you can see, this is mucosa with inflammation, some fibrotic, uh, um, some fibrosis in the lamina propria, and at the surface we could see some erosion. This was the border of a gastric ulcer. So nothing more special would be searched for, uh, except for the situation of being a HIV patient. So we paid more attention to the cellular details of the epithelial cells lining the glands, and uh, we found a couple of nuclei as this one that uh, was blurred and there were one or two others with the same features. So we consider the possibility of viral infection. We consider the possibility of um, CMV infection, even in the absence of the characteristic features of OI. Here you can see another that would raise also the same problem. So we jump to immunohistochemistry here, very useful. Uh, just uh, another view of the same glands, highlighting the presence of these nuclei. We can see here two of those, and you could have missed unless you had taken in consideration the clinical diagnosis. So the diagnosis in this case was uh, confirmed by immunohistochemistry, as I said, and the diagnosis was gastric mucosa with inflammatory lesions and signs of CMV infection in the setting of HIV infection. But this is a very easy case and gives me the opportunity just to show you uh, the context of CMV infection in the stomach that should be taken in consideration also. This is another case uh, from a child, now a seven-year-old boy with nausea, vomits, and generalized edema. This is a very important symptom. And the clinical diagnosis was, uh, as you will see, of uh, miniature disease. Uh, and the, uh, there were this uh, increase of the folds in the stomach with some erosions, and there was a kind of uh, hypertrophic gastropathy. And we could see also, and because we searched carefully, one or two nuclei that had the blurred appearance I described before, and that by immunistochemistry was positive by C for CMV. 
This was a very rare finding in his stomach, so the clinicians decided to ask for a molecular study, and this was positive for CMV, and it was positive the detection of DNA. So our histological diagnosis was confirmed, and the diagnosis was then hypertrophic gastropathy with signs of CMV infection. Is this relevant? Yes, it is very relevant because it is reported in the literature the occurrence of many diseases as a manifestation of CMV infection. Look at this in the 22 months old boy, can occur very early. And there is this highlight that the, you can have an unusual presentation of CMV infection that in, for clinics presents with generalized edema. So the pediatricians take this in consideration. And the uh, cytomegalovirus infection in pediatric age, despite being very rare, should be considered because this is relevant and the patients can be treated with improvement of the symptoms. Another case I want to show you because it was exuberant. Now it is in a 46 year old man. He had been submitted to liver transplant and was complaining of pains in the esophagus and stomach and was submitted to upper GI endoscopy and esophageal and gastric ulcers were observed. The suspicion from the clinicians was herpes infection, CMV, and actually they were absolutely right, as I will show you. Again, in the stomach, these blurred nuclei, and just to call your attention that you can see those not only in the epithelium of the glands, but also in stromal cells. This was conferred by immunohistochemistry. You can see the positivity in the glands and also in stromal cells. And the esophagus, the lesions were exuberant with uh, erosion, ulceration. And in the epithelium, you could see also again the signs that call you the attention for these nuclei that can be related with CMV infection, which turned out to be the case. And here you can see CMV positivity in these cells. But also, we could see these uh, multinucleated cells that immediately suggest that this is uh, the, uh, the presence, re the result of the presence of herbs. So we confirm this uh, observation the histology with immunohistochemistry, and again, this was positive, as you can see, and you can see the positivity in these uh, giant multinucleated cells, more correctly, multinucleated than giant cells. We move now to another case, and this is a very interesting case. This concerns a 15-year-old boy with suspected inflammatory bowel disease and abdominal pain. An upper digestive endoscopy was performed that did not reveal changes in the mucosa of the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. It's a, a bit strange, this normal endoscopy, uh, in face of the findings that I will show you. If you have a look to the scanned slides, you can see that one of the major findings in this mucosa was that there was mild infiltration at the surface in the lamina propria. But what was calling our attention was the presence of these lesions in the deeper part, which have all the features of granulomas, epithelioid granulomas, with a ring of lymphocytes at the periphery. But we could see not only these granulomas in the gastric mucosa, but also in some areas. And here you have another granuloma. If you pay attention to this area, what you can see is that in the glandular component, the compartment of the mucosa, you could see this uh, inflammatory infiltrate mostly constituted by lymphocytes and compassing also some polymorph nuclear cells. So this is what is described in the literature, the focal and enhanced gastritis. And for for us, we have a lot of experience uh, in Porto with this type of lesions in the setting of inflammatory bowel disease because of the interest of gastroenterology pediatricians. And uh, you should take in consideration that even if you do not have the clinical information of inflammatory bowel disease, if you have these find, findings, you, su you should suggest this possibility in your report. 
you, you can have uh, the uh, aspects of what I described before, the diploid granuloma in the same case, and focally enhanced gastritis, because there is this is focal and not dispersed diffuse in the gastric mucosa. So we come to the literature, and there you can see that this focally enhanced gastritis is a kind of, it was by then, 2013, a newly diagnosed pediatric inflammatory bowel disease would call the attention for this diagnosis. It is present in 43% of the patients, is more frequent in Crohn's disease than in ulcerative colitis, and is more frequent in younger patients. That is most probably the reason why we have uh, such a large experience in our pediatric patients. Uh, and further, in Crohn's disease, which was at the end the uh, case in this patient, uh, the focal and enhanced gastritis is more likely than those without to have active ileitis and granulomas in other parts of the gastrointestinal tract. So this is something to, to be taken in consideration. So we come to a summary of the different types of gastritis of non-helicobacter pylori gastritis. What I've shown you was an example of autoimmune gastritis with all the features were, that were present. Uh, just now focally enhanced or enhancing gastritis in which you have these uh, mixed lymphocytic and neutrophilic infiltrate and related to inflammatory bowel disease can also be seen in bone marrow transplantation and granulomatous gastritis. I've shown you a case in Crohn's disease, but there are many other settings in which this can be found. And just a few words about the types of gastritis in which there is diffuse involvement of the stomach, such as lymphocytic gastritis, characterized by the increased number of interepithelial lymphocytes in the glands, eosinophilic gastritis, in which you can find many eosinophils in the lamina propria. And uh, uh, usually there is a clinical setting of allergy of connective tissue disease and even parasites. And you have also one of those uh, rare gastritis, which is collagenous gastritis, which is characterized by the presence of this subepithelial collagen band that I'm showing you and that can be highlighted by specific stains for uh, collagen. There are other types of inflammation in the stomach in which inflammation is so, not so intense and this encompasses reactive gastropathy, gastric control, vascular ectasy, uh, portal hypertension, gastritis and graft vessel disease. So in the case I've just presented to you, the histological diagnosis with granulomatous gastritis and focal and gastritis in the setting of Crohn's disease that was confirmed afterwards, the diagnosis in the stomach. Now case five is another type of lesion. It's a very interesting case. And here you have a 35 year old man with a long last dyspepsia. This was an amazing case. Uh, the patient was submitted to endoscopy and uh, multiple non-healing gastric ulcers uh, were observed that failed to respond to proton pump inhibitors. And there were no signs of helicobacter pylori infection. Uh, consecutively diffused gastric mucosal sickening was observed, raising the suspicion for a neoplastic process. And on the basis of these findings, and without confirming with the uh, uh, another biopsy, this patient was submitted to gastrectomy. In the gastrectomy specimen, uh, what we could see is what I'm showing you was full thickness section of the gastric wall in which the lesions are observed in lamina propria. At low power, you can see lots of lymphoid follicles <clears throat> and not only these lymphoid follicles, but also the expansion of the lamina propria by a dense inflammatory infiltrate that was mixed. There you could see not only lymphocytes, but many neutrophils and also eosinophils. You could see some lesions that uh, are of the type of uh, the crypt abscesses, and we were completely puzzled with this situation. We had never seen such a case in adult. There was erosion of the superficial epithelium and there were reactive changes, but there was no evidence of neoplastic process. 
as it had been suggested in the previous biopsy that we had not the opportunity to review. So this was really an impressive clinical situation and uh, we decided to share this case with members of an international histopathology club. I'm not going to read this in detail, just to show that everybody was really puzzled and the most strange uh, diagnoses were proposed, such as juvenile polypos makes no sense at all, a trough ulcer to give you severe gastritis, is a description, Crohn's disease of the stomach, never seen such an impressive inflammatory parasitic because of the eosinophils, autoimmune, it's nothing, the autoimmune does not look like this, and even in situ carcinoma in the setting of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer, that here makes no sense at all. So our working hypotheses were essential and usual severe inflammatory process with pseudo-lymphoma disappearance or adult onset autoimmune enteropathy. And we decided to send to Dr. Greg Rilaus by that time as Mass General Hospital in Boston. And he came up with this statement I've been using on the idea of syphilis in the stomach. So we came to the clinicians and they decided to search for the markers and the patient was HIV negative, but there, were, there was evidence of uh, uh, syphilis because the blood tests were positive both. In the tissue, the Martin Starry uh, staining was inconclusive. So it was decided to submit this case to CDC in Atlanta, US. And there the tests were performed, fluorescent antibody staining that turned out to be positive for Japonema pallidum and PCR real time for two genes of Japonema pallidum. And this demonstrated that there was infection by Japonema pallidum in the stomach. So the diagnosis became obvious and the diagnosis was that of gastric syphilis uh, identified by direct immunofluorescence staining and real-time PCR testing. And this, is, this was by then published in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology. I wonder if you have ever seen such an uh, impressive case. So this was the diagnosis and we come now to case six. That was the case of 67 year old man with dyspepsia and was submitted to endoscopy in which uh, some lesions were observed that I'm not going to show you and won't comment further on because what I'm going to show is the non-neoplastic mucosa. And in this case, endoscopic submucosal dissection was performed. So you, I don't know if you tried to, to identify here the presence of uh, cancer that was not present in this section, it was present in others, but there you can uh, diagnose this chronic atrophic gastritis with intestinal metaplasia, but that was not the issue of bringing this case to your attention. The issue was to show you these lesions. These lesions, you can see you could identify glands with the organoid arrangement, and this glands, what was really striking was the presence of these clear vacuoles. And uh, we were not sure by that time if this was a single cell with a basal vacuum or if this could represent two cells. So we had to study this in detail just to show you the major features again. And here in high power, you can see that the glands are aligned by cells and these are cells with uh, uh, abnormal localization of the nucleus, but the basal part is occupied by this vacuum that can be clear looking or having a glossy appearance. And this is designated as glossy clear cell change of the gastric mucosa. Is this relevant? Any implication for the patient? No, not at all. It has been described uh, since many years. It's not well known is uh, underestimated or overestimated. In my perspective, when pathologists look at this and are not aware of this entity, they tend to overestimate and to suspect of uh, intraepithelial lesions in the setting of air diffuse gastric cancer. So what do we have to do? We have to perform PAS staining, very simple, and the vacuoles are negative, as I'm showing to you. And what is characteristic is to have a ring of PAS staining at the apical pole of the cells lining these glands. So this, the diagnosis here was clear glassy cell changing in the setting of chronic atrophic gastritis. As I said, the differential people bring 
is with the deletions of hereditary diffuse calcium cancer, namely parasitoid spread of single cell signet ring cells, but it's different. Here you can see the signet ring cells spreading below the, the internal lining of the gland, and the signet ring cells, the cytoplasm is positive for PAS, completely different from what we have seen. And if you have intermucosal carcinoma, of course, you don't have an organoid organization if you have the infiltration of the lamina propria with PAS positive signet ring cells. So uh, summarizing the, the findings, this is a typical aspect of the clear glassy cell change. And if you look to the differential, one would be this pastoid spread, but here it's not a single row of cells, but it's two rows of cells, the internal of the gland and the external of signet ring cells. Some people also bring the hypothesis of in situ carcinoma, which is not the case. It's only one single row of cells, but they are, the, they are completely disorganized. And if you perform PS staining, the cells, they are positive. The cytoplasm is positive for PAS, and it's not a ring at the apical pool. We come now to the polyps. And the first concerns a 70-year-old female with a sessile polyp in the stomach. This is a very interesting lesion. I wonder if you have seen these lesions before. This is uh, from the scan slides, maybe the most impressive. And at low power, what you can see is a proliferation of glands occupying the lamina propria. This was an oxyntic lesion in the corpus of the stomach. And here, you, what you can see is that these glands, they are densely packed. And in their lining, you can identify two types of cells, parietal chief cells and principal cells, chief cells secreting acid and principal cells that, as you know, secrete the pepsin channel. If you look at high power to these lesions, as I'm going to show you, here you can see the typical features of those glands with stratified nuclei, in which you can identify two types of cells, the chief cells and the principal cells. And here, even in higher power, you can see those features. And this is characteristic of what is designated as oxyntic gland adenoma, which is composed of highly differentiated columnar cells with pale basophilic cytoplasm and mild nuclear TPA mimicking the oxyntic fundic gland, mainly shift cells. But as I said, you can have also parietal cells. And the tumor consists of irregular architectures such as tubular fusion and lateral expansion. The differentiation of this oxyntic gland adenoma is what uh, has been designated gastric cancer or fungi gland type that I will show in a minute. So the differentiation of the components of fungi gland is confirmed by immunohistochemistry such as pepsinogen for the sheep cells and uh, ATPase for the parietal cells. And you can also confirm your diagnosis using uh, mucin expression in MUX6 that is diffusely expressed in the glands of the lesion because of uh, the shift cells that secrete MUX6. And the MUX5 is seen only at the surface, the normal mucosal overlying. It occurs predominantly in the upper third of the stomach, 80% of the cases. Uh, mostly in uh, non-atrophic oxyntic mucosa, uh, and the lesions are similar to gastric no carcinoma fungi gland type, as I mentioned. The tumor can be situated in the upper portion of the mucosa, but can also be seen in the deeper part covered by normal fovelar epithelium, as you can see in this picture. The predominant cell, uh, cell type is immature shift cells that secrete MUX6, as I, say, I mentioned, positive for pepsinogen and MUX6 and the proliferation index by KI67 is slow in these lesions. So the diagnosis was straightforward and it was oxyntic gland abnormal. Uh, As I said, the differential is the fundic gland, the adenocrisomal fundic gland type, 
that was recently described and characterized. And there is a continuum between the oxyntic gland adenoma and this fundic gland type of adenocarcinoma, in which the glands are more irregular in the deeper part of the mucosa, they are nystomosing, and most importantly, they, uh, they invade the muscularis mucosa and they uh, can invade the submucosa, they can display lymphatic invasion, and in rare cases, metastasis, lymph node metastasis can occur. This is another case you can see in the literature in this very nice paper from Greg Lowers, in which you can see the glands that I described with the characteristic features. And in this case, the invasion of submucosa was obvious and highlighted by the disruption of the muscularis mucosa. Another type of lesions that you have to take in consideration in the differential is uh, the one I'm going to show you, this one affecting a 56-year-old female with an invaded lesion in the upper part of the corpus. This is the scanned image that you have been offered to look before. And what you can see besides some dilatation of glands was the occupation of the lamina propria by a proliferation, a small, tiny, regular glands uh, that uh, have the features of glands, antral pyloric glands. So when you have these lesions, you should think of the entity that I'm going to show you, and that is pyloric gland adenoma. Sometimes there is this uh, filiform appearance at the surface, and the pyloric glands can be very compact, as I can see. This is very, you can see very rare, less than 30% of all gastric polyps. There is an increased risk of malignance, should be aware. And the glands are closely packed, pyloric type, lined by a monolayer, as I've shown, of cuboidal to local laminar epithelial cells that can have a ground glass appearance. And you can see cystic dilation of some glands, as we could observe in our case. What happens here if you go for immune staining is that you expect to have MUX6 staining in the glands, in the pyloric glands, because they are positive for MUX6, but you can have not only expression of MUX6, but also MUX5AC, as it was the case in, the, in this specific uh, example that I've just shown to you. So the final diagnosis were pyloric gland adenoma. Is it important to be aware of? Yes, it is, because there is a lot of things known now regarding pathogenesis and mutations of this gene were described in these tumors. And uh, there is an update classification of gastric polyps that uh, in which the polyps are dividing those arising from superficial compartment of the mucosa and polyps developing from the developing, developing from the glandular compartment. Oxyntic gland adenomas and pyloric gland adenomas belong to this group with these specific mutations. Here you have a summary. So adenomas in the stomach, they are polypoid mostly of the cases. They can be uh, affect the superficial part and they can be intestinal type or fuvular type. These are PAS staining, and you have the cap of mucine in those cells. In the adenomas of the glandular epithelium, you have those I've just shown, the pyloric gland adenoma and the oxyntic. Both of them are max 6 positive in glandular component, and both have the mutations that I've described that can occur together with the APC mutations. And we jump now to gastric carcinomas. I'm showing you the current WHO classification of gastric adenocarcinomas. This is a group of people who has been involved in the fifth edition of digestive tumors of the WHO published in 2019. You cannot see, but Dr. Singh is there. He was, uh, well, amazing to collaborate and uh, to, to see his enthusiasm when describing uh, what you can do with digital pathology, and that was included in this version of WHO book. I'm not going to describe the most common entities, papular, tubular, uh, poorly cohesive signet ring type, uh, type or poorly cohesive not this type, mucinous and mixed. I'm just showing you the classification for the, from the Japanese Gassi Cancer Association published in 2017 to convince you that there is a direct correlation between the entities 
in the two classifications, despite a different terminology for a poorly cohesive, that if it is signet ring cell, a type that jet is designated as signet ring cell carcinoma. If it is poorly cohesive, not otherwise specified without signet ring cells, the jet is call it poorly to non-solid type. What I'm going to address is some specific histological variants of CASI cancer. The first concerns a 49-year-old man with a large tumor in the duodenum. There is not much to describe. It was a blue tumor. And there you could see that you could identify glands and some areas more solid, trabecular, as you can see. And what was impressive was the amount of inflammatory infiltrate in the stroma composed mainly by lymphocytes. So at low power, the diagnosis that comes immediately to you is the possibility of a carcinoma reaching lymphoid stroma. We search immediately for the infection with EBV, EBV epsilon bar virus, which turned out to be positive by ever technique, technique and it was 100% positive. So the diagnosis was straightforward, carcinoma with lymphoid positive, uh, stroma ever positive. The interesting thing here is that this is a very rare entity in the duodenum. In a literature, uh, literature search, I found only one case. And here the designation was of carcinoma with lymphoid stroma, which is equivalent to the entity we are describing, carcinoma with lymphoid stroma or lymphoepilioma-like carcinoma, in this case, in the duodenum. In this case, Eber was also positive in 100% of the cells and there was no microsatellite instability. This gives us the opportunity to present a brief description of the features of GASTI cancer with lymphoid stroma, and there are two molecular settings to be considered. Most of the cases are related to EBV infection, about 70%, but you should take in consideration this can be negative and you should search for microsatellite instability and these cases can be related to high microsatellite instability. Uh, the survival is better for any of the types, uh, lower PTNM staging is the, 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 what usually happens, the expensive growth, younger patients, they are common to both entities. Why is this relevant? Because of tumor immune microenvironment and because uh, these gas carcinoma with lymphoid stroma can express pd one so they are putative target for immunotherapies addressed to pd one PD-1 immune inhibitory checkpoint. And this is in practice already in clinics. And we come now to another case, and this uh, is uh, concerns a huge ulcerofulgating stroma, uh, gastric tumor. This is a very difficult lesion. It was really a problem for us. What we could see was a tumor composed by blocks of neoplastic cells and differentiated with high mitotic rate. There was these inflammatory cells in the lamina propria, but there was the erosion, there, was, there were many mitoses, and we thought this was a carcinoma, but we had to demonstrate. Would it be some anaplastic cells? It would be at least an undifferentiated carcinoma. So we performed a couple of immunostainings. You can see the H and E again, and it turned out to be diffusely positive for cytokeratins and EMA. So this confirmed the diagnosis of carcinoma and taking together the histology with what I'm going to show you now, which is the vimentine expression with this peculiar dot pattern. So the diagnosis of an differentiated carcinoma was made. So I wonder still today the reason why we decide to perform additional immunohistochemical studies. And these were directed because the cells were somewhat polyhedrical to the search of uh, epithelial differentiation that turned out to be positive. Epar1 was positive, glipicon 3 was positive, alpha fetoprotein was positive, and so 4 was positive. It was uh, amazing. You were not expecting. So our diagnosis was poor differentiated carcinoma of the stomach with hepatoid features, which uh, in this specific situation is a rare case because of the undifferentiated aspect of the tumor. 
uh, we should take in consideration that there are in the stomach other tumors with hepatoid differentiation, namely alpha fetoprotein expression, and this can have a completely different phenotype as the one I'm showing with clear cells, adenocarcinoma with clear cells, or this entity that I will address later, which is adenocarcinoma with enteroblastic differentiation, also characterized by alpha, alpha fetoprotein production and still dog sac tumor. But I wanted to give to you the major features of uh, hepatoid adenocarcinoma, now not undifferentiated as the case that I present to you, but uh, the more usual presentation with the polyadrical cells expressing alpha fetoprotein and with the characteristic globules that stain positive for PAS. So this is the diagnosis direct of hepatoid adenocarcinoma of the stomach. You should be aware that you can find hepatoid adenocarcinoma in many other organs in the digestive system, esophagus, rodin, shun, colon, pancreas, gallbladder, but also in the other localizations. Among all, the stomach is the most common site. So these, uh, uh, even so, they are rare, something like 0.32% of gastric cancers. They present at an advanced stage of the disease. They are extremely aggressive. And uh, <clears throat> most tumors have metastasized at the time of the diagnosis. Morphologically, the problem is that hepatoid adenocarcinomas may have identical morphology and immunophenotype compared with hepatocellular carcinomas. Is this a problem? Yes, it can be a big problem because if you have nodules in the liver and you are not to get information that there was a tumor in the stomach, you can consider the possibility of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and this uh, turn, may turn out to be wrong. So this differential is difficult and should be done carefully. Uh, also because the liver is the most common organ for metastasis by hepatoid adenocarcinoma. The metastasis may be showing the differential diagnosis because of similitude, but uh, you should uh, take in consideration that most hepatocellular carcinoma, the expression of EPPAR is diffuse, whereas in hepatoid adenocarcinoma tend to be focal. And there are new markers recently suggest the transplant pointed as a new marker for this differential diagnosis and still others such as SAL4. And you would expect because I've shown already the results of the expression and especially useful to distinguish hepatoid carcinoma from hepatocellular and also cloud in six. The specificity of cloud in six for hepatoid carcinoma is I with 100% specificity for the distinction from hepatocellular carcinoma. So combining Planck, SAL4, Claudine 6, uh, you can make the differential diagnosis between hepatoid adenocarcinomas and hepatocellular carcinomas of the liver. And so we are talking about new biomarkers of the diagnosis of hepatoid adenocarcinoma that can be very useful. We come now to case 11. This is 86 year old maid with a large tumor excavated, sharply de demarcated with raised margins. This is a Bormann type two for those of you who use this microscope classification and was localized in the body of the stomach. If you were here, you have the microscopic features showing what I've just described, the broad margins is not the infiltrative pattern that you can see in the other involvement type three. Uh, here you have the scan slides and uh, you can see in these scan slides that you can see papular structures, also some tubular structures and all these together with solid structures. And what is relevant if you pay attention is that the neoplastic cells, uh, many of them, they have a clear cytoplasm as I am showing here, not only in the solid areas, but also in the columnar areas in the papillary and tubular structures. This is uh, very impressive. It's not the pattern of a, a conventional adenocarcinoma. You have, you have a full thickness section of the tumor. You, you have these logical features with the, the solid structures, and I'm going to show you in more detail these solid structures with clear cells, 
uh, cytoplasmic clear cells due to accumulation of glycogen. And here you can see the epithelium, which is clear, namely at the apical pole, reminding the fetal gut epithelium, which is very relevant for the diagnosis. And you should search the presence of iodine globules that you can find in these cases, not in 100%, but when they present, they are very useful. As I mentioned before, this tumor secrete of a fetoprotein, express also glypic and three and salt form. So this is adenocarcinoma with enteroblastic differentiation. And I brought these cases because I said I wanted to discuss with, with you histological variants of gastric cancer, not common types. Gastric carcinoma with lymphoid stroma, hepatoid adenocarcinoma with enteroblastic differentiation, adenocarcinoma of fundicline type. I've not shown you micropapular adenocarcinoma, but the features of a, the, this micropapular adenocarcinoma are the same you can find in other organs that are specific in the stomach just to know that it can occur though a uh, rare neoplasia. And you should be aware that these two variants, adenocarcinoma with enteroblast differentiation and invasive micropapillar, micro they are very aggressive with poor prognosis. Uh, on the contrary, the carcinoma with lymphoid stroma, the prognosis is good. And even better, very good prognosis for the entity I described to you, gastric adenocarcinoma of fundicline type. And you come to the last case, which is a very nice case. It was the first one I've seen my own. i would seen it in the literature before. In this case, it was performed endoscopic submucosal dissection. I'm not going to show you the, the rest of the slides, but what is the region of interest? I don't know if you managed to see where it was. At low power, I think that you would uh, suspect of intestinal metaplasia, but bizarre. It is uh, the growth is strange, uh, parallel to the surface, merging plants, and with bizarre shapes and X here or something like that. And so people can be faced with hypotheses of an atypical intestinal metaplasia, but why only at, he, or at this part? Or who oh God knows if this could be a, different, a well differentiated gastric carcinoma. Here you have the features that I described before and the distinction challenge, challenging from intestinal metaplasia. And I'm already telling you the name of this entity, which is crawling like adenocarcinoma. And an important thing is now and then you can see some uh, signet ring cells. And we should know that uh, signet ring cell carcinoma can be developed in the setting of this lesion. This was the case in this uh, specific uh, case that I presented to you. In the literature, you can find uh, the publication of cases very simple, uh, very similar with this bizarre shape of the tumor and also some cases with this signet ring cell that should call the attention of coexistence or the possibility of progression to diffuse gastric cancer. So crawling uh, type adenocarcinoma of the stomach is a distinct entity that can uh, evolve, uh, progress to poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma in the sense of poorly signet ring cell carcinoma is irregular, characterized by irregular fused glands with low-grade cell atypia and uh, the lateral spreading uh, the glands in the mucosa for it was proposed this nickname of WHYX because of the bizarre um, feature appearance of the glands that remind the alphabet letters. Some others have uh, suggested they look like Chinese characters. The tumor lengths uh, can be overlooked and uh, people should consider the distinction for non neoplastic lesions such as intestinal metaplasia, as I mentioned. Uh, there is a lot of things uh, now known about these tumors and one which I find very interesting is the demonstration of rho mutations and fusions involving codeine 18 gene. Why is this interesting? Because these are molecular features of uh, poor cohesive carcinoma, signet ring cell type, if you prefer. And uh, if you have in a tumor, as the one I've shown to you, which is intestinal type with an osmosing lens, and if molecular studies performed and these molecular changes are found, 
diseases that are specific for diffuse type of gastric cancers, you should consider this diagnosis. So this is an entity that cannot be forgotten. And there are other features that I would not detail too, too much, such as mutations in P53. And these are deletions. So you do not expect to have the expression of P53 in these tumors. MSI is not a, P, a feature. And these are EBV negative. So Kroll-like uh, carcinomas independent entity of gastric cancer in terms of clinical pathological and molecular findings. And so this is our final diagnosis and we come to the end. And of course, I want to thank you very much for your attention. And if you have the time, I can ask, uh, can reply to one or two questions, I guess. Dr. Singh, it's your turn. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for the excellent presentation. I think many people will learn a lot about these cases that they might uh, very like occasional. Some of these cases are like cases that people are not going to think about unless they've seen them once in their lifetime, basically. <clears throat> so I think a very spectacular talk. Uh, let's go to the question that we have. So let's start from the top. Yeah. How, how to differentiate an oxenthic gland adenoma and a fundic gland polyp? This is uh, <clears throat> the, the, the fundic gland, the, the oxenthic gland carcinoma. You have packed glands. You do not have cystic dilatation. While in the fundic gland polyp, you usually have some cystic dilatation of the glands of the surface. And in the lining, you can see parietal cells that they help you a lot. Usually, these fundic gland polyps, they are not a single one, but you can find several of those. So at low power is where you make the differential diagnosis. Thank you. The next question. <clears throat> Sometimes <clears throat> clinicians request for CMV stain in gastric biopsy with other underlying pathologies such as IBD. May I know how do you interpret a rare positive CME stain that is one to two nuclear staining in absence of it uh, in absence of typical histology? Uh, yes, and uh, in our environment that is not a big problem. Uh, yes, we should uh, take in consideration the positivity without uh, typical histology. And when the clinicians ask, usually in our environment, they, they ask also simultaneously for molecular testing. So we have the confirmation with the molecular test. Thank you. What cell constitute a hyperplastic polyp of the stomach? Can they be confused for a fundic gland polyp? No, I don't think so. The hyperplastic polyp of the stomach is mainly a lesion of the fuvial or epithelium. So what you have is the cells that are columnar with the mucine cap at the surface, the apical pole, while the fundic gland polyp you have in the lining of the cystic glands, as I mentioned before, the presence of oxyntic cells, sheep cells and parietal cells. And this is extremely helpful. Okay. And the roundish appearance also of the fundic gland polyp, which is not the appearance of the hyperplastic polyp, which is more irregular at endoscopy. Okay. In crawling like crawling. adenocarcinoma, does the atypia reach the surface? Uh, it can reach. It can reach the surface. Okay. But it essentially affects mainly the glands, the proliferating lateral spreading with those bizarre shapes. It's a fantastic lesion, believe me, <laughs> <laughs> when you have seen it once. <laughs> I, to, to be completely honest, it was the first time I knew from literature, so I submit this to our friends, Japanese pathologists, because they have a much larger experience, and this was confirmed. Yeah. How often do you diagnose serrated adenoma? You're sorry, diagnose of a? Serrated, serrated adenoma. How In the stomach. You, how, how often do you diagnose serrated adenoma? Very rarely, adenoma? very rarely. In the stomach, I wonder if I have ever done, I have described serrated aspect, but I consider seriously when I'm tempted to make the diagnosis out of the context, it's mostly a lesion in the common rectum. Okay. And then the last question is how, and how the glands are fused and still call it low-grade atypia? 
uh, okay, it's because you have to consider that you have two types of atypia. One is uh, architectural, and this concerns of using an irregular shape of the glands. And the other thing that is distinct is the cellular atypia. So even some authors would describe this crawling like adenocarcinoma as extremely well differentiated carcinoma mimicking intestinal metaplasia. So these are distinct features that do not have to go together. Okay. And uh, I think there's one case, one last question. And after that, we'll move to the next one. In the syphilis case, do you need plasma cells to diagnose? It helps. The problem in our case is that we had the plasma cells. I have not described in detail. We also had some, um, the, the endothelium of the small vessels was really preeminent. So together with the plasma cells could have led, led us to the diagnosis, but it, it has not crossed our mind because it was so exuberant and there was such a mixture of uh, inflammatory cells with so many lymphocytes, so many lymphoid follicles. So it didn't cross our mind. But as you have seen, and I was very honest, it crossed the mind of Greg Lowers. That's why he's one of the most eminent gastrointestinal pathologists in the world. Yeah, experience is always <laughs> important. So thank you very much, Fatima, again, like for the spectacular talk. There's a lot of thank you messages in the chat also, which uh, I think so the people are really like, uh, all the attendees are very, very appreciative of all the great cases that you showed. Uh, and then uh, now we'll move on to the next next set of speakers. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks. So our next speakers are going to talk about head and neck pathology, and they are two great pathologists from Germany, uh, Dr. Stephen Euler and Abbas Agami. Uh, both of them are professors in the departments and are like described as the go-to people for review of difficult cases. Uh, so we are going to uh, bring them on and uh, let's see how we can quickly bring them on yep. so let's go back here to the chat participants okay, let's go. 